Hey guys, welcome to video 58. Today we're going to begin our discussions of vacuum tubes and vacuum tube circuits, in particular amplifiers and power supplies. But I'd like to start off with a little bit of review of some of the uh, theory we introduced way back in the first videos of this series where I talked about semiconductors and diodes initially. And I want to begin with just a quick discussion of the concept of energy levels and electron states in atoms. Uh, if we look over here at this diagram, we've got energy versus uh, the different types of materials we've got to work with. Uh, there are two areas we're interested in, the conduction band and the valence band. If you recall, in solid state materials, the valence band was the uh, shell or orbital where electrons were basically holding the material together, like silicon or germanium and so on. And the bonds between the atoms at the valence band level are what holds the material together. Now, if you increase the energy of the electrons that are in the valence band sufficiently, they can enter what's called the conduction band. And here, they're free to move through the material. And if you've got an abundance of electrons in the conduction band, you've got a good conductor. Now, if we look at metals, we see that the valence band and conduction band overlap with one another. And uh, it forms basically what's referred to as a sea of free electrons. These electrons are free to move back and forth through the material under the influence of an externally applied voltage. Now, the difference in energy levels between the conduction band and the valence band is what's called the band gap of the material. So metals essentially don't have any band gap. Semiconductors have a relatively small band gap. Uh, typically for silicon, for example, it's 1.14 electron volts. For germanium, it's 0.67 electron volts. And these bands are close enough together that when we add dopants to silicon or germanium, we can modulate the band gap and produce usable PN junction devices. Now, in insulators, the band gap is relatively large, and it takes a lot of energy to move electrons from the valence band to the conduction band. Some typical band gap values for insulators are 9 electron volts for silicon dioxide and about 3.01 electron volts for titanium oxide. And also, another name for the area between the conduction band and the valence band is often it's referred to as the forbidden band. Uh, electrons are not stable when there are energy levels in between the conduction and valence bands, so they will tend to drop back down into the valence band rather quickly if they're at an intermediate energy level. Now, interestingly, whenever we have electrons recombining uh, with holes in the valence band, that is when an electron goes from the conduction band to the valence band, its energy state changes. And if the band gap is large enough, the uh, transition will give off a photon. And this is the basic idea behind light emitting diodes. Uh, the larger the band gap, the shorter the wavelength of the light, uh, the closer the band gap, the longer the wavelength. So infrared LEDs have a relatively narrow band gap. Blue LEDs have a wide band gap. I also should mention here that the Fermi level, named after Enrico Fermi, is essentially the average energy between the conduction band and the valence band. Okay, now I don't want to get too far off into the weeds here. Uh, i got to control myself. LEDs are fascinating, and I'll probably make a video about them sometime in the future. But for now, let's just go on to the next page, and we'll do a quick review of PN junction characteristics. We've got the schematic symbol for a PN junction diode here with the uh, diode current and anode to cathode voltage designated. And 
a uh, transistor connected as a diode as well. Now over here on the left we've got the graph of diode current versus anode to cathode voltage in the forward bias region. That current is given by Shockley's equation and the curve I have shown here is typical for a 1N4000 series diode. Uh, down here on the right we've got uh, the common diode packages you're going to run into most often. And with this little bit of review behind us, let's now go on over and start talking about vacuum tube diodes. Okay, now let's start by taking a look at the schematic symbol for the vacuum tube diode over here on the left. We've got two main terminals, the anode, which is also sometimes called the plate, and the cathode. And in this case, we have an indirectly heated cathode the heater or filament is used to heat up the cathode, which creates a cloud of electrons around it. This is called the space charge. And the whole operating principle is called thermionic emission. I think it's a lot easier to understand intuitively than, say, the operation of a PN junction diode. But in any case, the cathode, the anode, and the heater are enclosed in a glass envelope and we remove all of the air creating a vacuum inside here and that's why it's called a vacuum tube. We have two regions of operation, reverse bias and forward bias. Okay, in reverse bias the anode is negative with respect to the cathode and since these charge carriers are electrons they're negatively charged. They are repelled from the anode and we get no current flow. Under forward bias, when we make the anode positive with respect to the cathode, it's going to attract electrons from the space charge region and they flow through the tube, creating an anode current. The current is given by what's called the Child-Langmuir equation, or sometimes called the three-halves power law. The anode current under forward bias is equal to K times the anode to cathode voltage raised to the 3 halves power. Uh, the constant of proportionality K is called perviance. And for a couple of different common vacuum tubes, here are the K values. For the 5AR4, it's 0 0.003. For the 5U4GB or GT, it's about 0 0.0008 and the 5Y3GT has a K value of about 0 0.00035. Over here on the right, I've graphed these three different uh, K values for those tubes, and you can see that for a given voltage drop across the tube, the 5AR4 carries much more current, so it's a more efficient uh, rectifier or diode than the 5U4GB or the 5Y3GT. Now let's go over and take a look at these three rectifier or diode tubes that I've talked about. They're all 8-pin octal socket tubes. You're either going to get them in this large coke bottle format uh, glass envelope or this smaller version. The socket is shown down here. This is the numbering system for the socket, looking at it from the bottom. And notice that these are all dual diode tubes. And that's because the power supplies that we're going to typically make using these diodes uh, uses a two diode full wave rectifier configuration. We'll take a look at that in the next video. Now also notice that the 5U4 and the 5Y3 uh, have the uh, cathode and this heating element or filament are one in the same. Okay, so these are called directly heated cathodes. The filament is the cathode versus the 5AR4 where we have a separate heating element from the cathode. And this is called an indirectly heated cathode. Now I also should point out here that we don't really have two independent diodes in any of these tubes. We've got two diodes with a common cathode terminal. So you're kind of limited in what you can do, but normally it, it doesn't matter. We're only going to be using these particular tubes as uh, power supply rectifier tubes, and this is how we'd hook them up anyway. Now let's go on over and take a look at the partial data sheet for the 5Y3GT. 
This one is from General Electric, and nowadays GE is known mostly for their jet engines and locomotives, but back in the day they were a vacuum tube powerhouse. This particular data sheet has a date of 1955, and the first thing we see here is that the filament or heater operates from 5 volts DC or AC, so if that's AC it would be 5 volts RMS. It draws a current of 2 amps, and this tube has to be mounted vertically. Uh, if you try and mount it horizontally, the filament may sag and short into the plates. That's not a good thing, so you have to mount this one vertically. It's designed to withstand 1400 volts of reverse bias and carry a constant forward DC current of 440 milliamps per diode with a peak forward current of 2.5 amps. Now, there's a lot of information on here that we're going to skip over for the time being, and what I want to do is go on over here and look at the average plate characteristics. That would be what we would traditionally call the transconductance of the diodes for this tube. It's a graph of diode current versus, in this case they're calling it plate voltage, that would be anode to cathode voltage, V sub AK. And notice that for a given current value, the voltage drop across the diode is pretty high. For example, at a current of 100 milliamps, this diode is going to drop pretty close to 45 volts from anode to cathode. So compared to a normal PN junction diode, Vacuum tube diodes have really high forward voltage drops. I'm going to talk a little bit more about the transconductance curves here in a second, but just for comparison purposes, let me uh, paste here the heater current, uh, peak inverse voltage rating, and forward current ratings for these three uh, dual diodes, the 5U4, GB or GT has a heater current of 3 amps. It can withstand a peak inverse voltage of 1550 volts and can carry a forward plate current of about 1 amp. The 5AR4 has a heater current of about 1.9 amps, can withstand 1500 volts of reverse bias, and is designed to carry a plate current of about 250 milliamps maximum per diode. And finally, the 5Y3 again has a heater current of 2 amps, PIV 1400 volts, and a maximum plate current of 440 milliamps. Okay, now we're going to wrap this video up in another minute or so, but before we do, I want to take another look at the transconductance curves for the 5Y3 GT. So I plotted the uh, child Langmuir equation using Desmos with a K value, a pervience of 0 0.00035, and I superimposed that graph over top of the data provided from General Electric using the same aspect ratio, and notice that the theoretical curve and the actual curve provided for the tubes by General Electric is almost identical. And that's one of the things that you'll notice about vacuum tubes is that their uh, values, their parameters are extremely tightly controlled compared to those of transistors, for example. And that's a really convenient uh, characteristic when you're designing amplifiers, and we're going to take advantage of it when we do design amplifiers using vacuum tubes in upcoming videos. So uh, for now, that's all I've got for you. Next video, we're going to take a look at power supplies that use vacuum tube diodes, and we'll compare them with traditional linear power supplies using PN junction diodes. So that's all I've got for you today. I will see you next time around.